different ways you can do it. I don't care which way you do it. Whatever feels most comfortable to you. I'll try to show you both ways. First thing you have to do is you need to isolate the power. So this is the only thing being raised to the 7x. So I need this isolated. So this is being multiplied by 2. So you need to divide by 2 first. And so then e to the 7x equals 42 when I divide. And now right here is where there's a couple of different ways. So the way that we really have talked about it in here is my variable is stuck in an exponent. So I could rewrite this from exponential to logarithmic. That's the way we've talked about it. And so that would be um, log base e, which I could write as the natural log of the answer, 42 equals the exponent, 7x. Now then, I've got the variable in line. I can do algebra with it now. It's out of the exponent. Follow that. And so x is being multiplied by 7. So now I'm going to divide by 7. And so now I've got x isolated. So x equals that. That's one way you can think about it, going from exponential to logarithmic. That's not the way I do it, but that's the way we talk about it, okay? So for me, when I get to this step, it's the same process, but I just choose to take a log of both sides. So the log of E is inverse operations, and I know those cancel. And so if you think about it, like, so, okay, I'm going too fast. Think about if I log this for real. What could I do with this exponent? I could bring it out front. Are you with me? And now then, what's this asking? E raised to what power is E? You understand that? Because natural log has an understood base of E. So E raised to what is E? It's 1. So this number is 1. 7x times 1 is 7x. That's the big explanation. But what I really do is log base e cancels 7x. Like that's the way I work it. I just know that whole process. Same thing. I don't, I, there's not one that's better than the other is my point. Just pick one that you feel comfortable with that makes sense to you. And like I said, I know you just have to do a lot of repetition. So, like I said, that canvas, 4.3, was that the one? 4.3 canvas. You should be able to do that one completely. Work through that. And if you work through it correctly, not using photo math, not copying my buddy's answers, if you work through those, can I follow that process? That's a good starting point. And I can answer questions from there. Because like I said, this is a good problem. This is kind of the entry level question. 11 to the x is plus 1 an exponent? Mm -hmm. Okay. Equals 7 to the x minus 1. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, So, again, for me, variables are stuck in the exponent. So the way I can get rid of those is I can take a log of both sides because the powers are isolated. Power on the left is isolated. Power on the right is isolated. Log both sides. So what's that allow me to do if I log both sides? I can move the exponents down in line. So this becomes, is that minus 1 an exponent? Or is the minus 1? Okay. So x plus 1 times the natural log of 11 equals x minus 1 times the natural log of 7. The thing you have to be careful about here is this all is still being multiplied by the natural log of 11. That's why I have it in parentheses. That's the tricky part of these. That's really the only new step. From here, it becomes algebra. You're just doing algebra with uglier terms. But don't let it distract you. It's the same idea. 
I've got X's on both sides stuck in parentheses. So I need to get my X's to the same side. Right, we follow that logic. So to get them out of parentheses, I need to distribute on both sides. So this becomes X natural log of 11 plus 1 times the natural log of 11 is the natural log of 11 equals X times the natural log of 7 minus 1 times the natural log of 7, which is negative 1. Natural log of 7. Very good, very good. Now what? I've got, them out of, I've got them out of parentheses, so get my variables on the same side. Everything with a variable to one side. Everything without a variable to the other side. So I'm going to move this over and move that one over. I can think about subtracting, however you want to think about it. It's just It gets very um, ugly if you start trying to subtract those things everywhere. So I'll just move them. X natural log of 11 minus X natural log of 7 equals, now I've got the negative natural log of 7 minus the natural log of 11. We good, we good, we good. And here's kind of the next step that this one always confuses people when we get to this. Those are not like terms. Can't combine them. Right? That is not x natural log of 4. They won't combine. Now, You might be thinking, so tell me what you're thinking. I don't want to put thoughts in your head. Same base. They are the same base. That's what I thought y'all might be thinking. Same base that are being subtracted. So you could rewrite the arguments as division. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. Okay, let me tell you why that's wrong. You can only do that rule when they are naked logarithms. Again, I don't have a good word for that. I can't have anything in front of those logs. So these X's would have to go back in the exponent. And that gets me farther away from what I'm trying to do. You follow that? You're kind of going back to here where the X comes back to the... So that would be... That's not a bad thought, but that's the wrong thought. I, I'm, I'm being legit. Like, that's a good thought to have. That's what I thought you would think. Hopefully you see why that doesn't work. Um, think of something... What's something else you could try? Math toolkit. Two variables on the same side. They won't combine. Factor. It's another toolkit. You just looked ahead. Factor. I've got an X in both terms. That's the reason. Everything with an X is over here. So GCF and X. So this is X, natural log of 11 minus the natural log of 7. Do we follow that logic? And that's very common. So now you've seen it. Put it in your toolkit. You know that you can do that. Okay, that happens a lot. Now I've got a single X. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I can solve when it's one X. X is being multiplied by garbage. So what do I need to do? Divide by the garbage. It's not. It's this. Just leave it. I'm sorry. You think? Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah, when I do area equals length times width, I do put the L in cursive, but I don't with a natural log. Mm -hmm. I might need to. It's a good. I'll take that. That's coaching point. <laughs> Okay, if I look here, think about what my tools are that we've learned. Um, so, again, I know you can look at what they did, but pretend like you don't know where to go with this. Well, I have two different powers, and they both have an X stuck in them. So, one option is if I can isolate a power on either side, then I can take a log of both sides. Do we do that? We did that with the natural log of, or it was 11 raised to the x plus 1 equals 7 to the x minus 1 or whatever that was. So in that case, we had a power isolated equals a power isolated.
When I have isolated powers, I can take a log of both sides. Only when they're isolated. So right now, they're on the same side. So my first thought when I look at this problem is, can I get a power by itself on one side, a power by itself on the other side, to isolate? Brandon says no. Why not? Because this constant. So if I move this term over, this is still there. Do you follow? There's three terms. So because there are three terms, I can't get just one and one on either side. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. No? Uh, you just mad that Brandon knew? Yeah. Okay. Stop it. Well, that's a, well, the thing is, that's, that's, a, that's not a pre-cal specific idea. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is a... I don't need to... Talk. Okay, so, don't, don't let me... I'm going to say stuff I don't need to say. Um, so, I can't do that. That's one tool, but I can't use that one. So, okay, then i got to think of what are some tools I have when I have three terms? I know how to factor. When I have three terms, it's a trinomial quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c. And so, do I kind of see that pattern? ax squared plus bx plus c. Kind of. I've got x's here and here. This one's a bigger exponent than this one. Yeah? Do we follow that idea? So, let me show you this. I don't know what they showed you as the answer, but think about this exponent for a second, raised to the 4x. Because of the laws of exponents, do you agree that 4x as an exponent can be written as 2x all squared? Because, no, no, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. They're both in the exponents. So let me say that again. If I rewrite this as exponents, so whatever the base was, e, let me just put it as e in this one specific. I don't want to get. Do you agree that e to the 4x can be written as e to the 2x to the second? When do you have to distribute the 2 both 2 and x? No. What is this? This is a power raised to a power. We follow that? So what do you do when it's a power to a power? Multiply. So what is 2 times 2x? This is not 2x squared. This is e raised to the 2x raised to the second. It's a power to a power. So do you see they're the same form? So I could rewrite this as 2 times e to the 2x squared minus 7 times e to the 2x. That's another tool that you're going to use a lot of the time now. Make it look a quadratic. Now do you see a x squared plus b x plus c equals zero. Now the problem is I'm covering this up and saying treat this like an x. But there already is an x and it's up here in the exponent. It's not just an x. It's more than that. So this is where the u substitution comes in. I want to treat it just like it's any other variable. So I'm going to say let's let u be equal to e to the 2x. I just decided that. U substitution. New tool in the toolbox. So if I U substitution, what would that look like now? This would be 2. And instead of saying e to the 2x, what can I say? U squared. Minus 7 times U And we go from there. So then you're going to factor it. I assume we do the A times C method, which is 30. 
but multiplies to be 30, but combined is negative 7, negative 10, positive 3. Is it okay with me doing that kind of quickly? You see why, like, I can't spend all the time on factoring. That's supposed to be like already. Do I need to do, I need to do more than that? Do I need to do more than that? Yes, no, no. Everybody? Group, group 2, U is the GCF. Um, that should be U minus 5. GCF here is 3. That leaves me with U minus 5. The parentheses match. That has to happen when you factor by grouping. So that's good that it did. And so this factor is to be what's in front of the parentheses times the matching parentheses. And so, can I say u equals negative 3 halves and u equals 5? Are you okay with me skipping to there? Oh, yeah. I took two things multiplied to be 0. Mm -hmm. So the 0 multiplication property. Either this has to be 0. So I said 2u plus 3 equals 0 and I solved it. Yeah. Mickey Mouse techniques, if you like. I don't think I've talked about that in this class. u minus 5 equals 0. Mm -hmm. So u equals 5. I just skipped all the Mickey Mouse techniques. Okay. Do I care what U is, though? Did the problem ask me U? No, the problem asked me with an X. So if I use a U substitution, I have to substitute back. And so this becomes E to the 2X equals negative 3 halves. And E to the 2X equals 5. I just undid my U substitution. I went the other direction. Yeah? And I solve for X. So can I solve for X in these? So for me, I would take a natural log of both sides. Be good with that. You could rewrite it. You could take exponential to logarithmic. That's an option. Me, I just log both sides. That's the way I learned to do it. So that's 2x equals the natural log of negative 3 halves. I, again, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to gauge. I have been here for a while. Divide by 2. So there's the first one. We'll get there in a second. And then the second one, if I log both sides... This is 2x equals the natural log of 5. Do I follow that? Divide by 2. And so x equals the natural log of 5 over 2. Why are you shaking your head no? Um, <clears throat> log of negative numbers. Uh-huh. What's the domain of a logarithmic function? Only from 0 to... Infinity. I can't have the argument be negative. If I do, that's out of bounds. It doesn't make sense. So while I found two solutions, one of them is called an extraneous solution. It's not really possible. So this one is not an answer, only the natural log of 5 over 2 is the only one left standing. Good catch. So you always have to check that on these because you have domain restrictions. The argument can only be positive. The GDP, the gross domestic product, is a measure of a country's total economic activity. Have you guys ever heard of the GDP? In here? Yeah. Did I tell you what it was? Okay. Um, so this is how we tell if the country's in recession or not, right? If, if you have two consecutive quarters where the GDP has decreased, that's called a recession. So this is a measure for how well our economy's doing. And that's what they're saying here. It's a measure of the country's total economic activity, the value of all goods and services produced over a given time period, 
GDP per capita divides this measure by the population to get a per person unit of wealth. Data about the U.S. GDP per capita is given in the spreadsheet for the years 1800 to 2020. So I think that is on this page. So I think for me, I got to go four pages in the future. You guys see that spreadsheet? Whatever. Four front and backs. Two flips. I guess it's three in the future. Just ignore me. The next page on the back of it, or maybe, I, who cares, okay? Here it is. This is what it looks like. Question one. Does the GDP per capita seem to change by a constant difference, a constant second difference, or a constant ratio in a five-year period? So do you see a common difference every five years? So think about how much am I going up from, um, let's just look at the data here. So I'm just getting, a, I'm trying to get a brief overview for what's happening here. So like early on, how much am I increasing every time? So these are my X's, 0 to 5, 10, 15. These are my Y's. So to go from 2, 5, 4, 5 to 2, 6, 4, 3, I went up about 100. Are you with me? Not an exact. I'm just getting a rough. That's about 100. And then the next time is what? It's a little less than 100. It's about... I put 80, I mean, whatever. Okay, now let's skip down here. So what about from 637 to 4808? That's up about 170. And then what about from 4803 to 5105? That's up about 300. And how much do I go up the next five years? 1,000. 150. You see, I'm not finding the common difference for every one of them, but you see how I'm finding a general common difference. So do you think this is linear? No. no. I mean, it definitely looks like it's growing more at the bottom than it is at the top, right? If you go even farther down, I mean, look at some of those numbers. From 15,000 to 17,000. That's a growth of 2,000, right? Or from... 25,000 to 29,000. That's almost 4,000. So it's not going to be linear. What about second differences? So let's just look. Like, so like right here, my second difference is down 20, right? Here, this would be up 130 is the second difference. Here, the second difference is up 800. Do you think the second difference is constant? Is it a quadratic? How could I find it if it was cubic? I would need to find the third differences or fourth differences. Now, whenever we're fitting this to real data, it's never going to be exact most of the time. It's just going to be a rough estimate. Um, but it, it doesn't really look like it doesn't really look like it's linear. It doesn't really look like it's quadratic. Um, do you kind of see maybe that this could be? So, what they say here is, um, the GDP seems to be changing at a constant ratio of about 1.03 in the early 1800s. The differences in GDP are not constant. So, what they're saying is to get from one Y to the next, if you multiply by about 1.03, it seems to be growing. Which means what? Like, what does this mean if it's 1.03? Our economy is growing at 3% every five years. Because our, our equal interval inputs. Remember that fancy word that I had to talk about? How they were equal intervals over the X's, over the inputs? They emphasize that again at the conference. So I need to probably get back to saying that. I can't remember the exact phrase. Two, three regression models for the data and their equations are shown below. Do you think a linear model, a quadratic model, or an exponential model seems to fit the data the best? So here is 
This is called regression. So what they're doing is, do you guys see all those points? Those are the actual points for all this data. That's every point here. So this is at 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And this is our GDP, is the Ys, in every one of those graphs. That's called a scatter plot of the data. And then we're creating, do you guys remember maybe in like eighth grade? I don't remember if we did it or not, COVID out. Lines of best fit. We're supposed to do that in eighth grade, where you kind of take a bunch of points and you try to draw a line through them. So this is a line of best fit. Well, does the line look like it's a good representation for the data? Not great, because this data is not linear. Is it quadratic? So you see the makings of a parabola, and it would be going up over here. Does this fit the data? Um, better than linear, right? But it's still not great. Um, and when you look here, does this seem to fit the data? Better than the other two, okay? Um, one thing, um, and we'll talk more about it. We probably don't have time today to get into all the specifics. But what they talk about in stats is a regression model when I look at the um, residuals, okay? So what a residual is, is the distance from the actual point minus the expected point. So like right here, if I go just a straight vertical line, those are residuals. So you can see that right here, the residuals get smaller, and then these are positive residuals because they're going... Down. These are negative residuals because here our data over we overestimated what the actual data was, but here we underestimated. Are you following? Because this is my guess. This is my line of best fit. So when I look at those residuals, we don't want to see a pattern. If it's a good fit for the data, then you're going to have some overestimations and some underestimations. It's just going to be kind of random which one's which because it's a good fit for the data. Sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below, but in general, it's right between. Look at this pattern. So if my line starts here, what are all of these? These are all overestimates. And then what happens here? These are all underestimates. And then here it's overestimates. Or sorry, I'm doing it backwards. I'm doing it backwards. Let me say it again. Here I over... Here I... Okay, get it straight, Cody. Here the data is above my line. Again, I told you I'm not great at stats. Okay. We underestimated the data here. Here, this is what I estimated it to be, but it was actually beneath that. So here is overestimates. Here, I think it's going to be here, but it's actually way above it, so we are underestimating the data here. How long do you think we're going to keep underestimating the data following this trajectory? Forever. So do you see how there's a pattern? That's not good for the residuals. So you're looking for not a pattern. So here, do you see a pattern that's emerging? We are overestimating, then we are underestimating all of these, and then we are we're overestimating, but then it switches to underestimating. So it's better, but it still is like we're probably going to be underestimating forever. Here, look early on. What's happening? We're kind of on top of it. It's above it. It's beneath it. It's beneath. It's on it. It's beneath. It's over. There's not a pattern. So the, the less of a pattern you see, the better it is. Um, okay, give me the meaning of the 1914.704 in the exponential regression equation. So when we found this line, this, this exponential of best fit, this is the equation for that, um, for that exponential, I don't know how to say it, the exponential equation, right? That's the equation. 
So what's this number representing? The 1914.704. Yep, so in this case, what's the initial amount? Like, what does that mean? More context than initial. That's it. That is an estimated GDP in 1800. Because again, if you think about it, if I plug in zero for X, X represents how many years after 1800 it is. Plug in zero for X, this becomes a one, and this is then one times that is just that number. So in 1800, that's what we're estimating the GDP to be. What's the 1.0149 representing? Yep. Growth factor is the um, specified word. So this is an estimated GDP growth factor. So remember where we said it looked like it was 1.03? Growing by 3% every five years. Here it's showing it at about 1.15%. 1. Yeah, 1. Not actually 1. Point, I'm, I'm sorry. It's showing it as 0. 0.15. Yep, I'm, my brain wasn't working. Okay? This is showing it as about a 1.5% increase. My, sorry. I had a mental... I wasn't there for a second. I was thinking about something else. Five, use the exponential model to predict the GDP per capita for the year 1830. So if I wanted to use the model, this is the model, how could I estimate what it would be in 1830? 30 for X, because X represents the years. So... Do that in your calculator. So we're going to show them what we're doing. We're going to use the equation y equals 1914.704 times 1.0149 raised to the 30th. What we get? What we get? What we get? What we get? 2984.003. And what's it supposed to be in 1830? 3039.1584. Is that kind of close? You take that as an okay? I mean, it ain't great, but it's okay, right? It's. Okay. Six says, imagine if we took all of the data for the GDP and found the log of them. Use your calculator to fill in the selected values in the table. So we're going to be taking the log of all of these numbers. So this is log base 10. So go ahead and do that with your calculator. Take log of all those numbers. And let's fill out that table. Um, let's go to four.
What did we get on the first one? That's it? Everybody good with this? Know where their log button's at? Okay for everyone? No problems? Okay, let's think about seven together. What do you think a scatter plot would look like if I plotted all the years as the X and I plotted the log of the GDP as the Y? So my original graph that I looked at up above was what? It was the years as the X and the GDP as the Y. What shape did it take? It was exponential. And so if I take something that's exponential and I log those numbers, that's the inverse, right? A logarithm is an inverse of an exponential. So if you put an inverse and, I'm sorry, if you put an exponential and its inverse, a logarithm together, what would the graph look like? What happens when you put a function and its inverse together and build it as a... Following... Okay, 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 let's just, let's just make this up. We said this was about 1.03 to the x. So then... What would happen if I took log of 1.03 to the x? Right, because that's, that's really what's happening here. Log of that old GDP. So what would this look like? I can move the x. What is this? What is what is this? What is log of one point oh three? That's one answer. That's another answer. You're not wrong. You're not you're just not hitting on where my brain's going. What did you say? What did you say this was? So this is that, and then what's left? So this is just a, and this is, so what would the graph look like? Why? Because this is an x to the, First, and my parent function is x to the first is a linear function. And what happens if I build a function and it's inverse, and I put the composition together? What do I get? If f of g of x and g of f of x both equal x, they were inverse. Because this is a line that is the reflection of the inverse over like you put it all together all the different ways to get it to be linear so next page
They did it. They graphed it for us. And what does that data now look like? That used to be exponential. It now looks linear. Do you kind of understand why it looks linear? Taking a log of an exponential graph are inverses of each other. I'm flattening. Okay. Okay, let's think of it. Okay, I'm going to think, think of another way. Just give me a second. This is new-ish to me, too. I've never had to teach this. So I'm trying to... Okay. Zero, one, negative one, a half, one, two, two, four, three, eight, four, sixteen. All right, so you see how this is given that linear shape. If I log both sides, That's essentially what I'm doing. I'm logging the output. No, 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 no. Let me log the outputs. Just the y's. Now, it didn't affect the x's. I just logged the y's. So now, if I were to graph this same thing, if I plugged in 0 for x, 2 to the 0 is... 1, so the y is 1, so 2 raised to what power is 1? Zero. So now that I'm getting, an, when I plugged in a 1, I got out a 0. Now if I, I'm, I'm, I hope this works. If I plug in a 2, 2 to the second is 4. So I plugged in a 2, and then 2 raised to what power is 4? And if I plugged in a 3, eight, and then 2 raised to what power is 8? I messed up the first one. Plug in 1 again. 2 to the first is... 2. So this is a 2. 2 raised to what power is 2? 1. It should be 1. So I'm at 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. I'm essentially taking this exponential growth and I'm finding out what the exponents had to be. I'm linearizing the output. So the x's stay the same, but the y's that grew crazy are being drawn back to a constant rate of change. That's all I got in my head. Because what I'm really doing is oh my gosh. The original equation y equals number 1.03. I'm just making this up. These are my original inputs and my outputs. What I have done is I've taken these outputs and I have depressed them, compressed them to make it where it's no longer exponential. It's now linear. So I'm really just taking a log of one side. That's why it's called a semi-log. And like I said, we'll practice more with it later. They've given us for our transformed equation. Here is the line of best fit. It has a y-intercept at 3.2821. And it has 
an output, or a not an output, has a slope of 0.0064. So that is the line of best fit for the new linear data. Interpret the meaning of 3.2821 of this linear regression. So what is this? Yeah, and give context. So in the give meaning to. So in the context of what we're doing here. Yeah. So it is happening in the year 1800. What have I done to all of my outputs? I've logged them. So in 1800, this would be the estimated... log of the GDP per capita. So again, remember what a log does. A log spits out an output of the exponent. So because I took a log base 10, we are really estimating 10 raised to the 3.2821 power is the estimated GDP in 1800. I know. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I, I get it. I totally get it. B, what's the meaning of the 0.0064? Yes. So here's what they say. is The log of the GDP per capita is estimated to increase by 0 .0064 each year. Yeah, so like I said, this is a very niche thing. Like it's a very specific thing we're doing. We're taking something that would be hard to model without a calculator because back in the day, everybody didn't have a calculator, right? And it couldn't do this for them. So if I had a whole bunch of data that grew like that and it'd be hard to make an equation of, if I logged all the Ys and made it linear, I could find an equation for that. So they're... I think the main reason they're transitioning to this kind of thinking is because your calculator does so much that does it really mean you understand what's going on? No. So they're trying to... I mean, this is a throwback. Again, I've never learned this. It's weird stuff. C. Can you use the linear model to predict the GDP per capita in 1830? Can you do that? Try it. So you take that equation, and what am I going to plug in? 30. 30. I agree. So if you plug in 30, this is your output. So is this the number that we're predicting? No. It's the log of the number we're predicting. So how can I find the actual number we're predicting? What does the log give the answer to? This is the... This is the... What does the normal log question ask? If I told you log of some number equal 3.4741. This is the exponent. So how can I find the number? Oh. 
the thing I'm looking for. Rewrite it from logarithmic to exponential to find what it was I took a log of in the first place. It's a lot. I, I, again, don't expect you to be an expert at this. You're not going to be tested on this, on your test next week. Can I stress that enough? What did we get? 2958? I got 2979. Okay. So again, what they want you to know, the log of the GDP, right? The log of what it is I'm looking for was this number. So then I would need to rewrite it from logarithmic to exponential to find the actual predicted GDP. Here, the exponential model for the original data was given here. So that's my original exponential equation of best fit. This is after I took a log of the Y's this was my line of best fit. Okay? So how are the numbers in the transformed linear model related to the numbers of the original exponential regression? So tell me, how could I get 3.2821? Correct. Do we follow this? What does this represent in the linear equation? This is the y-intercept. What does this number represent in the exponential? The y-intercept again. Yeah, the initial value when x is zero. Right? They both are talking about the y-intercept. So how did I get from this number to this number? Well, I logged that number to get this one. All right, what about the slope? That's it. Oh, man, that's cool. Okay, so they just showed something mind-blowing to me. Okay, are we, are we following this? Yeah. Again, I'm, 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 I'm telling you, I'm learning too. Don't sit here and think, oh, yeah, I'm just so dumb. Like, what I'm fixing to show you, I didn't know this. This is cool to think about. So if I look at my original equation, oh, gosh, don't do this to me. Okay, I'm just going to a new slide. My original equation was y equals one point nine one. Nope, I'm doing it wrong, ain't I? Y equals one nine one four point seven zero oh four times one point zero oh one four nine to the x. Okay. What if I took a log of all of that output? Yeah, because it's the same idea, right? I'm logging the output. So this does give the semi-log graph. <laughs> Watch. What do I have here? All of this is the argument. So I have multiplication in the argument. How can I rewrite multiplication of the argument? Yes. Addition of the logarithms. So this is log of the first number plus log of the second number.
Now I can because this is the exponent for the entire argument. So now I can move this x out front in line. We good with that? What is log of 1914.704? Uh huh. So we just wrote, and what's log of this? What's log of 1.0149? And what's this? It's the equation of the line of. <laughs> Okay. When are we ever going to need to know this? Why would I ever do this? Why would I ever log the outputs? Here's what they say. Linear equations are easier to evaluate, to solve, to graph, to manipulate, to interpret. You should be very comfortable with a line. Because you've been doing that since you were in middle school. Where an exponential, those... Like, even that idea of the common ratio, of the rate of growth, right? That's a weird kind of idea that we don't have it. Like, we're not an expert at that. But when I'm talking slope, I'm expert at slope. I like slope all day. Okay. So we know it's exponential, right? So it should be y equals a, b to the x. How can I find this a value? Bring t into Do we agree that a is the y-intercept mm -hmm. of the exponential? And so this is the y-intercept of the logarithmic version of it. So the A would be 10 raised to the 3.8525. And so then what's the B value? Yeah? That's it. That's what they got to do. So there's them setting it up. And there's the numbers that they found. When they plug that in. So if it's going to be a non-calculator question, it's probably going to look like this. Right? They probably wouldn't make you get Okay, it says the five most common types of mathematical models involve exponential functions and logarithmic functions are as follows. Here's an exponential growth model. Y equals A times E raised to the BX. An exponential decay model. Y equals A times E to the negative BX. The Gaussian model. That is a German math mathematician. Can I remember his first name? That's his last name. Gauss. His first name. I want to go Frederick. I don't think it's Fred Frederick Gauss. It might come to me a second. Just give me a second. Anyways, there's his model. And here's a logistics growth model. Y equals A over 1 plus B E raised to the negative Rx. Okay. In 1950, Capital City had a population of, there's the number, the exponential growth model that approximates the population for Capital City is here, given to me. T is the number of years, and T equals 0 is the first day of 1950. So A since 1.03 raised to the t can be written as 1 plus 0.03 raised to the t. We 
follow that logic, this is 100% of everyone plus another 3% of people. Explain the meaning of 1.03 in the model. At what percentage rate is the population growing each year? That's it. You have the entire population, that's the one, plus a growth of 3% every year. Don't forget about that. B, what notation would be used to represent that the initial population was 68,532? So how do I know I'm talking about the initial population? How many T in here? That's it. The T needs to be zero. So we could write that as P of zero. That lets me know I'm at the beginning of time. Or in this case, 1950 is the beginning of time. That's the initial starting point. No C, what does P of 50 represent? 50 years, 50, 50 years after 1950. What's a, maybe a cleaner way to say that? 2000. <laughs> 2000. The population in 2000. Like, you're not wrong with the other one, but... Like, I like that interpretation. I'm not mad about it. I'm just saying the year 2000 is a little cleaner than... You may say it was 10 years and two score after 1950, right? I mean... Did you know a score is 20 years? Did you, everybody know that? You didn't know that? No, Did you know that? In the Gettysburg Address, it was four scores. Right? Four score and seven years ago. That was 87 years ago from the Civil War. It's when 1776. That's what a score. Okay. Um, anyways. D, in what year was the population double what it was in 1970? Hmm. Now we're getting somewhere. So, Ew. yeah. How could we figure it out? Uh huh. So, what was the population in 1970? Yeah. So that's the way you're going about it is not going to be the best. Way. So let's let's not find the actual number. Um, the deal is because it's growing exponentially from any point in time to where it takes to double is the same amount of time regardless. So let me see if I can think through this. I'm trying to not use my cheat sheet. That's a, that's a tricky question. So if this is the population and it normally equals um, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't know. Can I can I skip that one for a second? Sure. So e. E. Use the model to estimate the population in 1949. Can you, you just could you say like one minus point zero three instead of one plus three? You could, or what would be the time t in years in 1949? That's the easier way. So it's really 1 over 1.03. Could you do F? If you're plugging in 52. All right, that one's not bad. G, what's the average rate of population growth for the decade of the 90s? What's the key word you see there? Average. So what's that asking for? Slope. 
So how could I find the slope of the equation in the 90s? What would I need? So 90 and then 90 out. I'd need two points. So I would say 90 to 2,000. That's what they do too because that's the whole decade because at the beginning of 2000, I'm on the first day. So we would plug in 40 for T and 50 for T. Find those Y values. Am I doing too much without writing it down? Or are we following? I'm with you. That's a slow one. I'm, I'm trying to get it done before the bell changes. That's why I'm not writing all that down. And then I would just use slope. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Um, I'll take a picture of what they did. I've got to think through D. That's what they found. Right, do you see this Y2 minus Y1, X2 minus X1? Yeah. It's 10. Yeah, 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 I'm not. 